so it's not a big deal. <laughs> you know, who's ever going to watch? We're going to watch. <laughs> we started with seven last time. Okay, it started. Oh, okay, so should I start? Am I like, I guess sure, the thing to you know, we'll, is we'll, Rob. We'll see if anyone shows up. Five. We're up to five. That's pretty good. That, <laughs> that's not including us, I hope. Because if it's five, it means there's one. <laughs> It is including us, but you guys can start if you want because it, it is going to be recorded. It is recording, so okay. yeah, Good I turn. would start. Oh, okay. okay, all right. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague from NAMI New York State Board of Directors, Dr. Robert Leitman. So it's all the floor is all yours. Bro. Well, I have this thing recorded, so let's see if it goes. You know, that's what we're looking for. Why? There we go. Hi, this is Dr. Ken Duckworth, the Chief Medical Officer of NAMI. I am delighted to introduce Dr. Robert Leitman, uh, who is a leading advocate for the application of a full comprehensive approach to care for people who live with psychotic disorders, in particular, the use of clozapine, which is an underutilized treatment. Dr. Leitman is the leader of Team Daniel, uh, after his son Daniel developed schizophrenia 15 years ago. And Dr. Leitman stands out as a national leader in the promotion of clozapine and the supports, engagement, and community that go along with a recovery approach. Please welcome Dr. Robert Leitman. Thank you, NAMI community, for giving me the opportunity to talk about something that I'm absolutely passionate about, the optimal treatment of psychotic disorders, clozapine, engagement, and community. 15 years ago, I was introduced into the psychiatric maze. At that time, my son Daniel developed schizophrenia. And my wife and I, both internists, were amazed at the lack of uh, available treatments that would restore my son to what I expect him to be. I was told that his life as he knew it was over. I was unwilling to accept that. And so my wife and I set out on our journey and really began to read voraciously. We were helped by some outstanding people. But it was a tough journey. We actually had to go to five different psychiatrists. Daniel was subjected to four different antipsychotics, three at the same time, at points looking like a young Frankenstein's monsters as he shuffled around. Before finally, 18 months into our journey, we persuaded a psychiatrist to start clozapine, and that's when Daniel's true recovery began. Daniel, I'm happy to report, is a, a stand-up comic living in New York City. He uh, graduated from uh, SUNY Purchase on the Dean's List and is living a life of purpose and meaning. It took that long because clozapine has been given a bad rap from the very beginning. People have not understand it. First of all, it was synthesized by a man, a man named Schmutz. Again, not an, off to a great start. And then in the 1970s, there was the Finnish pandemic where uh, a few individuals in a small Finnish village developed uh, a very severe neutropenia and a few actually succumbed to that. This has never happened again. It took all the way to 1989 before clozapine was reintroduced in the United States. And even then, it was bundled and it was cost prohibitive, so it was rationed and it was not really used. And essentially, it became an orphan drug. When we went looking for clozapine, this is what we were told. We were only told about the horrible side effects. We were told that there was a 3% risk of severe neutropenia leading to death. We were told of seizures, and that's all wrong, the Bay Grand story. The tractable weight gain, our son would be a slug because of unremitting sedation. He'd be drooling, constipation. Everything on this slide was wrong. 
No one told us about the potential benefit. No one told us that our son who did have treatment resistant schizophrenia had failed multiple antipsychotics after a prolonged stay should be on clozapine. And it was the only FDA drug for that indication that my son who was suicidal at one stage also should have been on clozapine because it was FDA indicated. Other people have been subjected to violence. It happens fairly commonly and it's often at and against family members. Substance abuse can be a big issue, but more importantly, people accept clozapine the best of all the antipsychotics and it leads to the best recovery. Again, the first year clozapine is not used at all. In this population, we're losing so many individuals. Approximately 50% of individuals will try to complete a suicide. 10% will do so. In the first year, we can lose up to 3 to 5% of our population. If clozapine was used in the first year, we would be saving approximately 500 lives out of 10,000 individuals. What's the risk? What everyone always quotes, the feared risk that I was told was 3% of mortality. The actual risk is one in two in 10,000 individuals. That's 500 versus two. It's math. And then after you get past the first year, psychosis shortens lives by average of 20 to 25 years. Mostly half, about 40% by suicide, but the other 60% by amenable, treatable conditions, which clozapine will address. You can see this. This is the FIN20 study. This is the best study with 20 years of data with 62,000 individuals, people with psychosis, no antipsychotics. There is a 46% mortality in the first 20 years. Using any other antipsychotic, that was reduced, but only to 26%. With clozapine use, it's 16%. And here we see, again, in the U.S. population, if you use clozapine, it returns the suicide risk to the general population risk. Now I want to talk about psychosis a little bit, and I think you've got to understand what it is. It is a polygenetic neurodevelopmental process when not properly treated, that's neurodeteriorative. If you look at this plot, it's what's called the Manhattan plot, and there's a skyscraper there that we point out, that's the C4A gene. This gene in and of itself is responsible for up to 25% of the risk of developing psychotic disorders. So what happens in neurodevelopment is that you see pruning that goes on and that is normal. So you get a big fuzzy brain by around age 13 and then normally you would prune down so that you'd have a beautiful little uh, brain with good circuitry and all the rest. If you overexpress the C4A gene, what happens is there's an excessive pruning by the microglia, the brain's immune cells, and you're going to see a diminution in brain volume and disruption of pathways. This slide I have out as a clinical course of schizophrenia, but I also have it out because it describes not only the neurobiology, the risk factors in the course, but a problem people often are faced when with their loved one they face the psychiatric community. I'm fond of saying our lives are a movie. DSM-5 is often a snapshot, often a picture just at one point in time. The reality is most of these illness begin before birth. There are gen genetic changes that are going on in utero, there's genetic risk, and then what happens is early on in life we start to see some of the negative symptoms and the kid is diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. As time goes on, we will see that this will keep cascading and the kid will often find that he needs to quiet his brain down. So at that point, he would often turn to substance abuse, typically marijuana. That increases your risk fivefold. So all of a sudden the kid that was given the attention deficit disorder will be given a different diagnosis and it'll be psychosis secondary to drug abuse. They'll be treated typically with a drug that will dampen down the dopaminergic system. That's the standard treatment in the first year. The positive symptoms will abate and time will go on, but the negative symptoms are going on untreated. 
as is the neuro deteriorative process. They'll have another spike and then the diagnosis changes again. It's bipolar with psychosis. The emotional component, the mood component will diminish over time. It'll be more of a cognitive and um, a process with negative symptoms that are predominant and all of a sudden the diagnosis will change to schizoaffective. Time goes on, marches on, the disorder gets worse. It's mostly all negative symptoms with occasional spikes of psychotic uh, positive symptoms and then it becomes schizophrenia. Your kid hasn't changed diagnosis, you're just catching the kid at different parts of this disorder. So again, psychosis, it's a clinical syndrome. Again, the five components that I like to talk about are the positive symptoms, which is the delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and ultimately catatonia, which Daniel presented with. Negative symptoms are the inability to get started. They're not lazy. This is part of the disorder, the lack of joy, uh, and also the lack of speech. And often what you'll see is social withdrawal. And a lot of that has to do with the processing speed. You need good processing speed to be able to engage in conversation. And that is diminished. And you'll see changes in memory and attention and executive function. Ultimately, a lot of these people get discouraged and they develop very severe mood components. And the expression of that, especially in the first year, unfortunately, is suicidality. Hopelessness leads to suicidality. On top of all this, in about 75, 80%, you'll see comorbid substance abuse. All of that leads to the psychosis syndrome, which is the social occupational dysfunction and deterioration and suffering. So I want to talk to you about now my experience with psychotic illnesses and the team Daniel experience. It all started with Daniel. And that's, of course, what Team Daniel is named after. But since that time, we've been doing this for the last 15 years. We've, uh, we've gotten quite a population. At present, we have over 95 patients that are involved and are that were directly responsible that have been with us and that we have good data. Our data set closed in February. Uh, we also have another 40 patients that are between six months and a year. And then we have an extended family that we've tried to engage. All together, we've seen between 200 and 250 people in our practice to be managed on clozapine. Who comes to our practice? 52% came to initiate and a full 48% were on clozapine, but still not doing well, still suffering or enduring intolerable side effects, and they wanted to do better. These are our demographics. We actually have a bit of a sicker population. I'm often not the first step. Again, I am not a psychiatrist. By trade, I'm a nephrologist. At least that's what I was. The last 15 years, I've shifted my practice over to psychiatric internal medicine, as has my wife, Dr. Ann Mandel. And together, we've developed this approach. But nevertheless, 73% of our population is male. Typically, psychotic spectrum disorder, the figure is more like 60, 55 percent. Again, if you look at our demographics racially, it mirrors the United States. Again, our whole population, about 75 percent, are in the, in the schizophrenia spectrum, about 25 percent in the bipolar, and then we have a very small group that was uh, just actually substance abuse and uh, depression with psychosis. Have we succeeded with everyone? I wish it was the case. We've lost people when we can't engage them. We need the four steps. You need to be able to engage, you need access, you need treatment, you need support. If we don't have that, we fail. We have had two deaths. One was a 93-year-old woman who died of natural causes, and unfortunately the other was a suicide. How are we really different? We use clozapine. We use it not as a last resort, we use it as a first resort. And we believe you have the right to be well. We will listen, empathize, agree, and partner. If I can't get a therapeutic relationship doing that, I will turn to assisted outpatient therapy. We don't tolerate side effects. And we believe in meaningful recovery. 
community, a sense of engagement, family. We combat learned helplessness and hopelessness. We have to restore optimism. Again, serious mental illness is a team sport. What's our goal? It's not just to restore the mind. I want physically fit people engaging in life fully. I want them leading not only full lives, but long lives. And again, restore hope to the patient and the family. Using clospine first leads to the best outcome, including survival. Anything you use to do, anything you do to treat the duration or decrease the duration of untreated psychosis will help with the illness. If you're a psychotic, it's like a slow moving stroke. You lose about 1% of your brain every year. Clozapine is the best accepted, the most compliant, and will stop the process of over pruning, we think. It's the only one that has effects on the microglia. And then it saves people again in the first year. We're going to reduce that suicide rate all the way down. And again, it gets, stops drug and cigarette abuse. And again, the best outcome. It is the most effective. This is what we've seen, unfortunately, what we see in our practice. Because when someone has gone through first episode psychosis, you can see on the slide, normal looking brain, three relapses. You can see that little central area that's the ventricle getting bigger. That's because they're losing gray matter. And after eight relapses, they've lost a lot. These are kids we can't return all the way. The earlier you treat, the better we do. So this is how we define meaningful recovery. It's an important thing at least 20 hours of work or in school, raising a family. We have three kids that are having family and children and engaged, engaged in life. The R rate of meaningful recovery. Right now, the literature is anywhere from nine to 14%. The 9% study just came out of South Africa. 14% is the more recent literature. 37% is the best I did in the New Zealand study. Again, they had a very high clostin utilization rate. And in ours, we are at 75%. And it's again, it's across all, it's across all of the spectrum. Schizophrenia, schizoaffective, bipolar, everything. And even in the kids that I've had to use the AOT, we have 75% meaningful recovery. What's really important is we never see the hospital again. Again, all these kids basically have been in the hospital before they come to me. Only 13% have returned to the hospital since being in our practice. And of all those, only five have done so for mental health reasons. Remember, I told you, they told me my son would be a fat slug. Just doesn't happen if you're aggressive. Only 19% of our patients have gained more than 7% as opposed to the historical data. And what's cool about that is if you look at the people when they come into the practice, the ones that have gained weight were the ones that needed to gain weight. So my below normal patients gained on average of 8.3 pounds, but the overweight patients gained 15 pounds and the severely obese patients lost, again, they both lost 15 pounds and 30 pounds. Also, substance abuse, critically important. We had over 50% of our kids using illicit substances. And when they started with me, we're down to 6%. Cigarettes, we are incredibly aggressive, but doing so using Chantix, using uh, nicotine replacement, bupropion, we've gotten full two thirds of our patients to quit their cigarettes. It can be done. We've had adverse side effects. The pneumonia jumps out. And that's because I really have been looking for it because I know it's a risk factor and we live in the days of COVID. But in the literature, there's supposedly about a 40 to 50% mortality with pneumonia. We've had no one die from pneumonia and have only had two hospitalizations. Seizures has been more common. We do use high... Um, we use larger amounts and we do get up to larger therapeutic uh, drug levels of clozapine. 
substantial weight gain, and I want to get back to that, of the eight that did gain weight, seven of those people did not stick to the, what I wanted them on. They were non-compliant with the, with the medications and the approaches that I used to, to mitigate weight gain. But what is really cool about all this is our patients return to the level of function they had before they became sick. Again, this is preliminary data, but pre-illness, they were functioning very well. They had minimal symptoms. Untreated, they were universally in the hospital, often suicidal, not able to function. Without clozapine, they were out of the hospital more commonly, but severe symptoms and disabled. With the previous clozapine regimen, they were better, but still not functioning close to where they were before. And then after our approaches back to where they were. So how do we do this? We first get to know who these people are. You need to engage. They're in a lot of pain. I am a big believer in no barriers. I am an active, shameless cheerleader. I use Javier Amador's approach, listen reflectively, making sure that you know that they're hearing, that they're heard. I empathize and I always look to agree and partner with them. I engage the family and if necessary, use an AOT. I try to really break down the barriers. Again, serious mental illness is a team sport. And also it is a long, hard road. There's nothing easy about this. This is serious illness. And what I've learned over the years, taking doing medicine for many, many years, with serious illness, you can't pussyfoot around. You really have to go after it. But if you do, the rewards are outstanding. All my patients know that I'm available. I've been a little overwhelmed of late. I used to get back to everyone in 24 hours. I still try to get back within 48 hours, but they all have my cell phone. They all have my email. Compassion and availability. Everyone leaves with the treatment note so they know exactly what they have to do. And optimism, optimism, optimism. How do we start? We start with doing an exam. And again, I have to emphasize, you have to do therapeutic drug monitoring. You must be a doctor to do this right. We avoid the predictable side effects. This is just the slide. I want you to have this information. All of these things can be avoided. The weight gain, the metabolic syndrome. I don't allow the fast heart rates. Seizures we prevent. We don't put up with the drooling. Constipation is almost universal. You need to address these things early. Neutropenia, as I said, has not been a big problem. And it has not stopped anyone. I've actually successfully re-challenged two people with known acranulocytosis and been able to go ahead and treat them. In the population of color, they often start with a low white count. The recognition of benign ethnic neutropenia is important. These kids need to be treated with clozapine. You need to avoid the side effects, and there are ways about it. This is an important slide, but I want to emphasize what I've learned is when you're first enhancing clozapine, except using the support, um, and the psychosocial, because that you can do right at the beginning. But first you need to quiet their mind down. You need to have the psychosis fairly well controlled before you start to use these other agents, because every one of these agents eventually comes back and works on the dopaminergic pathway. And if you're doing that, you can worsen psychosis. So all these agents can be used and you need to know your patient. And there has to be some experimentation. There really does, but it should be reasoned and reasonable. And again, quiet the mind first. Again, it's complicated. Our average medication list is 11. They're all long clozapine, but a lot of these kids are on all these other agents. And again, I have to emphasize, you must be a doctor. You can't accept the side effects. Otherwise, you're just not going to be able to use this drug correctly. And here's just another slide showing more of the other medicines that I couldn't fit on the other slide. But what I really want to emphasize on this slide is the medications that I do not use. I avoid stimulants. 
we know the concerted, the Ritalin, the ADHD drugs will increase the risk of psychosis fivefold. I will not use them. Also, I avoid Depakote. That increases the risk for a granulocytosis. But not only that, it worsens the side effects for clozapine. It makes the sedation worse and the weight gain worse. Cogentin, again, there's really re very little reason to use that because that is the movement. Clozapine has minimal movement side effects. And again, cogentin worsens the anticholinergic, uh, the, the stuff that makes you sedated, that worsens constipation, that makes your heart race. I won't use it. I really try to avoid other antipsychotics. They tend to add to the side effect burden without benefit. Having said that, some patients have failed clozapine at very high doses, and at the very end, I will use uh, typically Abilify, which has the best data. Benzodiazepines, I try to avoid. Again, it slows people down, it hurts cognition. I'm looking for meaningful recovery. How do I really engage? What really is outstanding about us is we treat our patients like people and their family like people. We're all in this together. So every Saturday morning before COVID, I would have my patients and their families come to my house and the willing people come and run with me. I've run 99 marathons. Uh, I love to run. For me, it was my escape from probably serious mental illness. Um, and I think it's a critical component. Um, again, walk and talk. A lot of people are really uptight in my office and just the ability to normalize and have them at my house, the engagement's been great. I have a great dog. She comes out and greets them. My wife, Dr. Mandel is there. My kids have been involved. It's normalization, socialization, befriending in a non-medical environment. Again, we are a team sport. COVID came, that stopped. So for a while we went to Zoom, which provided us an opportunity to reach other people across the country. So what we've been doing of late is we've been alternating because COVID is relaxed. So for the last few weeks, we've been doing a Zoom session one weekend and a session where we bring people back to the house. Um, we have three hours from 11 to two and that I run with my wife and then Daniel runs the Zoom sessions for the kids. What do we emphasize when we get them there? I always talk diet and exercise. I just want to put these slides up. And again, exercise, all the meta-analysis, all the experience, it's been studied a million times. Everything gets better. The global functioning gets better. The quality of life gets better. I can't talk about exercise enough. So how do we start clozapine? We go slow, much slower, and we get there to therapeutic levels for the patient and we see them every week. We try to minimize sedation. As they get better, we shift to bedtime if we can. The benefits of an ultra slow titration is we use the lowest effective dose and it allows us to really address the side effects better. And it avoids some of the other major potential side effects. Again, this is what's in the literature. We are at an approach that goes at about a quarter of that. And with that, our secession rate is much lower than most people. We have a retention rate of 85 to 90%. Again, doing it slowly, we find out what the dosages are. As you can see with people in the bipolar with psychosis, we tend to use lower, but the ranges are enormous, 12.5 to 400. And again, in the schizophrenia spectrum disorder, it's 25 to 900 with a mean of uh, 300, median of 300. Therapeutic drug monitoring. Again, you don't know what the metabolism is of these drugs. And that's really important. Again, you need to monitor and we push levels. Our levels of 727 nanograms per deciliter are often higher than what the labs will consider. And I get alarms all the time from my outside lab, but this is what the kids need. And this brings me to the important pathway 
that if you're going to use clostridium, you need to understand how it is metabolized. This is a drug that's metabolized via the liver through the cytochrome P450 pathway. Cigarettes dramatically lower clostridium levels because they stimulate the pathway. Caffeine increases it. Caffeine's great for the sedation, but it's important that you keep it steady. You need to be aware of other drugs that interact. Again, you must be a doctor if you're going to use this. Also, and this became really clear in the years, uh, the year of COVID, inflammation dramatically increases level. So our recommendation with a COVID infection with fever is we cut the dose in half before we even meet the level because we know levels will double with an inflammatory state. We can use the same pathway to make clozapine a better drug. This is one of my tricks that I've used in over 60% of my individuals. I actually block the pathway using fluvoxamine. And doing that, I've increased the clozapine to the norclozapine ratio. And that's important because clozapine is the only active component that contributes to being an effective antipsychotic. Norclozapine contributes to the side effects. So by increasing the clozapine and norclozapine ratio, I'm able to use higher clozapine dosages or actually levels to affect a better treatment for the psychosis. And the benefits accrue. There's been an improvement in sedation, sleep time, weight, silurea, not especially so because the norclozapine is the one that contributes to the salivation, but also positive and negative symptoms. The one risk is the seizures, and that's why I use all of uh, these. When I use fluvoxamine, I'll use it with a uh, seizure uh, medicine. Lamotrigine is the one we typically use. That said, it has to be done cautiously. I start with micro doses of fluvoxamine. I start at 6.25. I check levels every week, and I go up weekly only after I know what the level is, and it's a constant adjustment. You need to do this expertly and carefully. I can't overestimate it, but it does work and it is helpful. So if I had everything that I wanted, what would I have? I would have a psychiatrist with me or an NP who's also quite adept at medicine, a full-time internist or a psychiatric internist or a neurologist. I would have a nurse practitioner, anyone that could prescribe clozapine. I would love to have a psychologist. There are some states where psychologists can prescribe meds. That would be great. But I also want them and the so, yeah, psychiatric social worker to be involved. It's a full biopsychosocial approach. So I want cognitive behavioral therapy. I need case management. A lot of these kids, there's a legal interface. I need that social work to help avoid go to court but again, mental health court, and stay out of the jails and the prisons. I need a peer specialist. I have one actually who comes to my house. She's wonderful. She's graduated from Columbia Presbyterian, and she's an active component of our practice. She's been on Clausby for 30 years, and I can't tell you how important she is. People see how meaningfully recovery can happen. We have to give work. We have to give work. We need to befriend, we need to normalize community. Exercise training, again, nutrition, all of these things, these kids can engage in this. Family support, the family, we need them. Again, it is a team sport. Listen, keep the emotional temperature low. Where I've had failures is when I have a household that is in a ruckus. I can engage them. And these are the kids that I've not done well with. Full supported housing, substance abuse, pet therapy. As I said, my dog, you stare into her eyes, you get a little oxytocin. Full biopsychosocial approach, meaningful recovery. Recently, there's been a game changer because one of the things that has stopped people, we always say, what stops people from starting clozapy? A lot of people say they just won't go for the blood work. Well, now there's a point of care device developed by Atlas, and I have no uh, interest in this company. It is a finger prick testing device, and it is simple. It is easy. You can buy it from the company, and the company will actually come to your house, 
do blood pressure and pulses for you, which is really important and weight. And those are the basic things that I need if I'm taking care of someone remotely. So they'll do that and get me my absolute neutrophil count. This is a real game changer. And I can't tell you, it's so important. What do people say about our approach? Um, been positive, not everyone. I could be a bit of a strong personality and I do butt heads and I'm really convinced that we're on to something. This is better. This is the correct approach to psychosis. And I tend to be a little pig headed, but I try to work with families. But nevertheless, these are the positive things that people have said. Some of my favorites, clozapine quieted my mind instead of deadening it. And kids on clozapine look normal and act normal. You have to be part of the tribe to be back into society. And then one of my absolute favorites, clozapine turned the lights back on in my eyes. And that's what I saw with Daniel too. You just see it in his eyes. And this is our Zoom family. These are the people that agreed to be shot, a screen saving. But we're not the only ones that do this. And these are a few of the programs. The reality is I can't take care of everyone. I would love to. My wife and I are a bit overwhelmed. Silver Hill in New Canaan, Connecticut, Rocco Murata, a Dr. Saunders at Viewpoint, uh, Gopal Weiss in University of Maryland. Uh, other programs are Columbia Presbyterian the Psychiatric Institute does it fairly well. I've seen reasonable regimens come out of there. Um, and then McLean Hospital, there's a Dr. Mufson up in Harvard that I find very good. Again, Dr. Mandel and I cannot do this all alone. So we have challenges and there's a lot of challenges out there. And these are the harsh realities. We have to realize it is a serious brain disease. And unfortunately, a lot of these kids get worse. And there are a lot of kids out there that need clozapine, maybe 10 to 11 million. And it's a cognitive illness and it's incredibly costly and it's chronic and it's crippling. Again, one of the 10 leading causes of disability across the world. And you have to remember, what is it? It is a complex illness that's genetic, it's neurodevelopmental and neurodeterative, unless you use the right thing. And what should be used? Clozapy. Well, how do we do in the United States? Not so well. We're dead last in the world. We've got to do better. So we have so much work to do still. And this is what we need. We need to engage people. We need new laws. Assisted outpatient therapy is a county by county proposition. It needs to be universal. It needs to be across the United States. I can't tell you how it saves so many individuals. People accept it. People are thankful for it. HIPAA, the regulations have to be clarified. They have to be changed. Instead of someone hiding behind HIPAA, they should be said, they should be saying, if you don't do corroboration, if you don't get that information from the family, they should be in violation of HIPAA as opposed to the other way around. We need to use clozapine early, again, treating the illness, decreasing the duration of psychosis. And again, we need to rationalize the monitoring. The reality is with the severe neutropenia, 95% is in the first 18 weeks. After six months and a year, essentially the risk for clozapine causing this illness is the same as any of the other antipsychotics. It's crazy. Mandatory monitoring should not be ongoing after 18 weeks. We've got to use the finger stick. We've got to change the reimbursement. This has been a financial boondoggle for my wife and I. We need to make it fair. We need to have a carrot. We need to entice other people so that they'll do this. Also, we need the best delivery system. There is an injectable clozapine. It's not available in the United States. It's in Denmark, England, and Israel, and a few other countries. We need a long acting clozapine, but we have to teach the psychiatric community how well these people can be if we put in the effort. You've got to be relentless and you've got to be aggressive. Meaningful, meaningful recovery should be the norm. We should never accept the side effects. We should accept the slow titration so that people stay on the drug. Mandatory reading should be the clozapine handbook. Meyer and Stahl, and the book I had the honor of writing with Dr. the late Dr. Lou Oakler, who came up with the uh, the uh, the Sands and Pans Index, and my family, Meaningful Recovery. We have to promote early intervention. 
because the prodrome is a high risk period. We need to reclassify again, a neurobiologic syndrome, heterogeneous genetics, neurodevelopmental, and if not treated right, neurodegenerative. We've got to get better access, universal healthcare, more people that can prescribe. And again, not only do we have to give carrot, but there should be a stick because there's so many people out there using multiple antipsychotics for resistant schizophrenia when and where there's a clear indication or when they're suicidal and they should be on clozapine. These people should be penalized. It should be financial at the very least. We need to demonstrate. In fact, it's been demonstrated. There's a VA study that clozapine is cost effective. And another study that just came out in 2021, British Journal of Psychiatry, the NICE study, um, uh, National Institute Care Excellence, three things they found that saved the most money. 30,000 pounds on average, number one was the appropriate use of philosophy. Number two, early intervention. And number three, something near and dear to the NAMI heart, family involvement. And then what do you really need? You always need to be kind and competent. It goes a long way. I try, sometimes I can be a little bit too much, but you've got to engage people. You've got to open up yourself. You've got to let the barriers die down. And then you have to be competent. You actually have to be a doctor. You can't just say, oh, I don't do this. I don't do that. If you're going to use clozapine, it's the most effective drug, but you've got to use it correctly. So the system, it is broken. It is fragmented. People are suffering. We can do better. We just need the will. At this point, I just want to thank some people that have been really critical to really pushing me to do this. Um, I want to start with the, the late Deborah Levy, who's the person who said, why isn't your son on clozapine? She was at McLean Hospital and head of the psychology research lab. Without her, I wouldn't be here today. Um, Lou Opler. Lou was my mentor, and I miss him dearly help write the book. And I just can't say enough. He was a true mensch. Um, DJ Jaffe. DJ certainly ruffled a lot of feathers, but has been an inspiration, has shown me the way, shown me the problems in the system, and just has been of, un was just critical support. Also, I'd really like to thank some of the living. And the person that really stands out to me, well, one more person that passed away, I'm sorry, Connie Lieber from Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. She read my stuff, I couldn't believe it, 10, 15 years ago, would comment on it. Connie and Steve, they really were instrumental at pushing me forward and saying that translational research was important. And then of the living, I have to talk about E. Fuller Tory. Fuller said I'm doing important work and has pushed me to continue doing this. And I'm so grateful that I've got to know him over the years. I wish him many more years. And I'm just, again, I only could do this work because of all those people. So this is the books that I want you to read moving forward. And I have to also put on um, that you should See, edition number seven, Surviving Schizophrenia by E. Fuller Tory, Insane Consequences by D.J. Jaffe, also critically important books. This is my contact and Team Daniel's contact information. Again, we can't take care of everyone. I wish we could. I'm there to help. But the goal here is there's just so many people that need help. If we can get an army, if we can get to the government, if we can talk to the people in power. I'm always fond of saying, find me a billionaire and I can solve the serious mental illness crisis in this country. I know how to treat these people. I just need new laws. We need to do what Kennedy promised in 64. We need these centers of excellence all over the country, but using the most effective treatment. I can't tell you that it's happening, except for what we're doing. And again, as the years go by, and I've done this, 
you know, I first said, is it that I'm just lucky or am I on to something? Well, 200 some patients later, I'm fairly convinced we're on to something. I look forward to working for, with other individuals. I'm hoping to publish this data. Um, I want to thank also very important, uh, some people, Rachel Strife, who prepared all my slides, uh, Karen Breslin, who's been with me for years now and has also helped with the slide preparation. And then um, I want to thank also uh, and Angela Brisbane and uh, I want to thank um, uh, Mary and um, Bayer and, and Jane Dworkin. These are people that helped me run the team, Daniel. And more than anyone else, I want to thank my wife, Dr. Ann Mandel, who's been with me all through this journey and my son, Daniel Leitman. Daniel was our N of one. That's where it began. I was challenged many years ago by a gentleman that ended up writing the psychosis section in DSM-5, Will Carpenter, to show him that we can do this again, what we did with Daniel. I hope the data that I presented, I hope that the approach that I've shown you shows that this is a doable, actionable platform and that we can change the way we treat psychotic illnesses. I thank you for your time. And at this point, I am very willing and hopefully able to take all your questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Rob, thank you for everything you do. And, uh, you know, as you know, uh, I can am a big believer in clozapine and I've had Hi, Danu. So I think they stopped uh, the video at that point. Oh, the they did good. so we can do regular questions. There's oh. questions, but I don't know if there's anyone even here. <laughs> no, Let me see. How many participants we have? Not many, four. Oh. It's well, okay. there may have been more. Hold on, let me. That's okay. I had 500 at national. That was a good, that was a good show. Yeah. It, it was a very, very, very good presentation. Thank you. Yes. Just need to keep my head still. I'm doing better now with my hand on it. Too much emphasis. <laughs> mm. I've mellowed out over the years. I mean, look, I, you know, I just wanted to show it again. See who's been there and, you know, that was what very more, inspirational. What more, what more can I say? But Danu, I will send you uh, sure. the link. And sure. I'll get you on to the stuff. I can make and it really, someday. And yeah, and maybe you'll make it to my house one of these days. Of, you know, where I'm, do you I'm, live, Rob? Are you off the board as well? Or are we? I'm off what? this year. I think huh? this is my end. No, no, I will be off next year. Oh, well, all right. So I'm off now. I'm six years. Oh, well. Next year, it's going to be my six years. Yep, mine, this was it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, but this Nami Orange, our, our county is keeping me like- Rob, um, there's several different people on, but I have no questions in the chat. Oh, when I'm looking live online, there's several people here. Oh, okay, good. But I don't have any questions from anyone. So hold on. No one has any questions for me then. We Diane Craft says, thank you for your information. It is very helpful and interesting, but no questions yet. <laughs> very good. Um, otherwise, we are going to put uh, the talk that I, uh, NAMI National asked me to hold off um, until we were through this education conference. So this talk and the slides are going to be available on Team Daniel running for recovery.org. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll have them up by next week. Uh, there's lots of other slides and presentations as well. The data is a little old. This again, we closed our data set back in February. So I've actually hired uh, two of the people that I mentioned, Angela Brisbane and mm -hmm. Rachel Strife. They're they're my authors. The problem that new I've had is I've just been overwhelmed with clinical responsibilities. 
and I haven't had time to write. So the, the idea is to publish this. I mean, I'm going to probably take the low lying fruit first. I think it's easier. We're, we're thinking of doing two approaches. One, a global paper, which is really nice, you know, with real recovery, with the weight, with the medication. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a big magilla. I, I think it's better just to um, take it and break it down because one right. of the big sticking points is the weight. And we've had such tremendous success. And it's the numbers of the numbers. No one can argue with this is the weight at the start. This is the weight at the finish. And this is where we're at, you know, where we've had, you know, 75% of our patients lose weight as opposed to gain weight, you know, using, you know, with the agents out there, which I described the metformins, the sodium glucose transport inhibitors. And more recently, we've been using the, um, uh, the uh, uh, DLP uh, one uh, agonist, the uh, glucagon like peptide ones, the Ozempics, the Trulicity drugs, the injectables really quite remarkable how people respond. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's predictable side effects, just doing good medicine and uh, getting them to uh, engage with their diet, and do the exercise. And that's, that's an easy study. Can I ask you a question, Bob? Sure. What do you do? We are getting calls from family members. Um, they're loud ones. I mean, like having like schizoaffective, schizophrenia, they are not willing to go for the treatment. They don't want to talk to their doctor. Uh, they don't want to talk to the therapist. They are taking medications, but they think that the medication is not working. Right. Um, so, and then the symptoms are going worse. Uh, no, but they no, are just you, you got to direct them to what is possible. And you, you, you know, you always start with Javier Amador's approach. Yeah, it's really that is excellent. Yeah, yeah. You really, you say, you want to know what they want. It's that listening, you know, hearing them out. You know, the reflective listening. But what do you do them. when the when the one of the parent is very resistant, uh, just uh, yeah. enabling the son, completely yeah. enabling? Yep. If you have a, a parent that is not willing to provide support, and you have a kid who is not been hospitalized, no. not dangerous to themselves or dangerous to others, you're stuck. There is at present nothing you can do. There is um, nothing, yeah. Yeah, there is nothing. You need the support. That's why, you know, the title of the talk was not clozapine, but was clozapine engagement and community. If you can't engage, mm -hmm. my little acronym EATS, right? So you need engagement. That's the first step. That is true. And then you need the access. Then you need the treatment. Yeah, but what do you do mm -hmm. when, when there is help available? But the, the one of the parents, I mean, I've been here getting so many calls from the families. Um, but if they're, if they're adult children, they don't listen. They don't want to go for the treatment. Oh, if the it, children don't, but if the parents are on board? <laughs> the parents, one of the parents is so, I mean, like, just... Yeah. Like knows it all kind of a personality. Right. I, I've had parents like that and I fail. Uh, I think everyone fails because, uh, for instance, I've had the kids that come from horrific divorces and a parent is basically, yeah. if the kid was older, I would have reported the parent or if the kid was younger. You know, I would have reported them to Child Protective Services, but the kid's right. over 18. And I, I have actually reported parents over 18, but they said there's nothing we. There can is do. really nothing they can do because if they're, if they're if they're less than 18, you can report them to Child Protective Services, yeah. and that's the only legal thing you can do. See, this is the problem. I've been getting like so many families calling. What should I do? What should I do? You know, like we we try to tell them, okay, you can do this, you can do that, do this. I mean, like get engaged, but but if they are not willing to do it, there's nothing we can do. No. So a way of doing it is showing kids in recovery. So right. purely self-serving, I always say, why don't you go on to YouTube and look up Daniel Leitman? And he yeah. does his stand-up comic. And guess what? He's got schizophrenia and he lives in the city and he's success and he lives independently. Would you beautiful. like to do something like that? Or, you know, oh, you or I turn to um uh, God, who's the other one? The guy from AOT in Texas. And What's our friend's name in Texas, the AOT? 
Eric, yeah, what's Eric's last name? Eric Smith. He's all over the internet. So Eric went through AOT, graduated from AOT, is getting his master's now in this and talks mm -hmm. all over the country. So better that it comes from someone else. And then I mean, I'm I'm trying to tell them connect connect your loved ones with the peer support. Right. Peer specialist. Well, both, Rob, would the LEAP program here. help too? Like uh, Javier Amador's oh, yeah. well, LEAP? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Hobby's great and the program was free to New York State residents. Right. That's, yes. I always say that's what I always start with when I'm trying okay. to engage a family. Yeah. It's, it's LEAP. Well, listen, empathize, agree, partner. I mean, and that's easy. available November 17th again, too. Yeah, well, I did just start for the second time. <laughs> Right. But the problem is, Chris, if you have a family that's butting heads, yeah, kid that's torn between them and getting yeah. mixed messages, you're stuck, especially if that kid goes back and forth between the, the parents. You know, right. those are the kids where you just you have to I honestly I, I hate to walk away from anyone, but mm -hmm. my time is so limited. I like to help kids that I know I can help. So if you're fighting a family, I've dismissed those families from my practice because right. I can't do anything. I Christine, say, the recording is turned back. off. They're always welcome back. Hmm? No, nope, it's still live. I'm just not getting any questions, but you guys are yeah. asking me. questions back. I mean, like, so I, mean, I can't believe that there are so many families. I mean, they don't know what to do. And then they, God. But there, but there they're, really they're, is help. So, you know, I gave them that reading list. And mm -hmm. if, you know, there's one parent, you know, and I'm not going to, well, I'll toot my own horn again. Our book is really useful because there's four parts to the, our book, The Meaningful Recovery from Schizophrenia and Serious Mental Illness. The first part is Anne, and that's the mother's perspective. Now, Anne, right. Dr. Anne, my wife's also a doctor, but she really speaks very plainly in a good, good language everyone will understand. And then the second part's really important because it's Daniel. Daniel wrote up his own personal experience. So kids can see that you can have an organized mind, you can actually write, and you can actually live a, a life of purpose and meaning. And the third right. part is Lou. And Lou explains the problems in the mental health system. And then my part is if you're willing to take the journey, it's more an explanation of how to do it. And that's a little bit more complex. But the family has to be on the same page though. The parents, right. the family right. have to be on the same page. But then, What's the gold standard book? Surviving Schizophrenia, right? By E. Fuller Torrey. I asked my patients to, and families to read that too, because that is still the Bible. That still is a textbook of what is available and what approaches you can take. And then, you know, if people get disgusted and are, you know, want to join us in our advocacy, even though DJ Jaffe has had a uh, troubled past with New York State. I've always considered him a personal friend and have been yeah. a supporter. So in, insane consequences is part of it. Yeah, the laws, unfortunately, are against the Stanu. There is one slide that really, I felt like it was so, it's so true. The system is broken down and fragmented. Right. Oh, without a question. Yeah. And people are suffering. And also one in three people have the arrest records. Oh, yeah. good question. Yeah, we are, we're punishing mental And I'm violence. kind of, I argued with the assistant district attorney at the other, at like three days ago. How come this, I mean, I'm just looking at like so many people, um, something happened long time ago, long time ago, and they want to move forward in life. They right. want to move forward. They try to get the job. Okay, the job is available. Okay, they start working. The employer sees the thing and then they start, they, that's the end of the chapter. Right, yeah. they have a felony or a misdemeanor, and it's often whatever it is, petty crimes. You know, uh, breaking and entering, indecent exposure, loitering. Um, uh, this you know, one person lifting where they were really in, you know, in a it, it, This case. is like a death sentence. This is like a death sentence. Right. And I and, asked the district attorney, you know, uh, with a clean slate initiative, which is I don't know when they are going to pass it in New York State. Um, he was saying, oh, they don't seal the records for 10 years. Right. Even if it is like, you know, misdemeanor. No, no, we I mean, punish like, mental illness. I mean, what do we have? 380,000 so, people in jail with serious mental illness. 
you know, remember, right back. I, I kind of felt it. like this, the district attorney is fine, but the assistant district attorney, he does all the talking. He does all the talking. He is like a blockhead. Wait, what we um, I think our time is up, guys. It looks <laughs> like we should be. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything in close? But I think we actually yeah, are I out think of this it was, now. This was great. That's it. This was, it was very good. Oh and you know what goodness. the best thing is? We what? got to get to talk to each other. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but you did have a large audience, Rob. It was in the, it showed on the live screen. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, we had yeah. more than four people? Oh, yeah. There were about like 20. Oh, all right. I'll take it. Oh, that's it. good. So, <laughs> I would have liked some questions. I love questions. No yeah, questions. no questions, just the one comment. Yeah. All so, right. so okay, guys, thank but you anyway, very much. I learned, I learned quite a bit, Rob. All thank right, then. So well, as I said, um, give me a second. Wait, don't leave me. I just want to make sure I have that news contact information. Like, it's so give nice me, to see give you. Me, give me 10 seconds. Hold on, then. 10 seconds. No, 